such as through memoranda of understanding with 13 city agencies, which collectively supports 60 of the approximately 378 positions. There are an additional 221 headcount positions funded through various arrangements with other city agencies, including the staff working at DOI's Inspector General for the New York City Housing Authority, Inspector General for Health and Hospitals, and Inspector General for the Schools Construction Authority. This brings the total staff headcount who report through DOI's chain of command to 599. In other words, approximately half of our staff are funded through various financial arrangements with other city agencies or authorities. DOI has been asked to identify savings in its budget. Specifically, we have been asked to save $1.235 million over the next two fiscal years. I'm pleased to report that we've already met our target of $350,000 in savings for fiscal year 2019, primarily by reducing our overtime costs. And we have a plan that should enable DOI to be on track to save the entire requested amount through fiscal year 2022. In the three and a half months since I became commissioner of DOI, I've seen firsthand the distinct role that DOI has within city government. I and my executive team have been particularly impressed by the breadth of investigations on the agency's docket and the value the agency brings to the city, its employees, and the public at large. DOI's cases touch all facets of city government, from construction fraud and safety, to violence on Rikers Island, to theft of city funds and property, and fraud of all kinds committed through the submission of false records to the city to cover up an array of schemes such as faked inspections, home visits never made to New Yorkers in need, and fabricated business violations to scam company owners out of money. DOI is there on these matters and many others, protecting the public, safeguarding taxpayer funds, and upholding the integrity of city operations and the dignity of public service. Since December, I have immersed myself in DOI's work, understanding how we conduct investigations, how we use our resources, and how we make decisions. I also wanted to know how DOI was perceived by those with whom we do business, particularly other law enforcement agencies and the city agencies we oversee. And I wanted to visit some of the unique sites over which we have jurisdiction, such as the Rikers Island Complex and DEP's project in Marlboro, New York, known as BT2, where the city is repairing the tunnel that transports our water from the Catskills to New York City. DOI has a team of investigators and auditors on site monitoring that construction in the Hudson Valley. I have met multiple times with all of DOI's inspectors general and their squads of investigators to familiarize myself with the array of matters they are tackling and to ensure that we are focused on investigations that attack corruption in all its forms, from the more routine to the systemic. Our squads must be adept at conducting both short-term and long-term investigations because corruption happens on all levels and DOI's vigilance must be the same. I have also spent a significant amount of time meeting and reestablishing relationships with our law enforcement partners and with commissioners of the city agencies we oversee to foster a better understanding of DOI's mission and how we work and to make sure they know that we are here to find the facts and act on them with integrity and fairness. I hope that this greater awareness and improved relationships will lead to wider acceptance of our proposed reforms, will extend the reach and impact of our criminal cases through effective partnerships, and will build trust in our efforts to stem corruption, fraud, and waste, and improve city operations. These discussions have been illuminating. I believe we have positioned the agency on the right track, embracing DOI's unique oversight role as an agency that acts with integrity, goes where the facts lead it and uncovers corruption without fear or favor. Having DOI perceived and understood as an unparalleled law enforcement partner with a distinct expertise in how corruption can infiltrate city operations is among my goals and I believe we are well on our way to reaching it. I've also had the opportunity to meet several times with the Special Commissioner of Investigation over Schools, Anastasia Coleman, and to forge an effective working relationship with her and her team. As described in the October 2018 report by James McGovern on SCI, that agency is intended to function largely independently of DOI. However, Ms. Coleman has an annual reporting function to me as the DOI commissioner, and she has kept me up to date on the referrals she makes to the school's chancellor and on public statements she makes. We have an open and professional line of communication, and I look forward to that continuing during my tenure. 
The operational effectiveness of DOI's Peace Officer Program was one of the first top to bottom reviews that I and my executive team undertook, and that review is ongoing. We wanted to ensure that the program was following best law enforcement practices, properly supporting DOI investigations, and not wasting public funds. The outcome of our review so far has included some agency-wide policy changes and some streamlining of various aspects of the Peace Officer Program. By way of background, DOI's Peace Officer Program dates back decades and is an important part of DOI's workforce, giving us the authority to make arrests, participate in search warrants, undertake certain investigative operations that present some level of risk, and provide other law enforcement assistance to the agency's work. But certain aspects of the program had expanded beyond what I believe is appropriate or necessary to support DOI's investigative work. We have already begun addressing this concern by scaling back both the program and the costs associated with it, including eliminating some of the training that after our initial review we deemed redundant or superfluous to DOI's mission, and reducing some tangible items associated with the program, such as the number of uniforms purchased for peace officers. These changes have already resulted in eliminating one month from the previously four-month full-time academy training program and resulted in some savings of nearly $200,000, with hopefully more to come. I have also changed previous policies that I found got in the way of investigations, including the policy that restricted investigators who were not peace officers from performing field work. Effectively, this prior directive reduced the number of investigative staff who could perform any function in the field delaying investigations progress and impeding the professional development of DOI staff. Decisions about who goes out into the field are now governed by the needs of the investigation and an assessment of the relevant facts about the operation. For example, where there are concerns about public safety or the safety of DOI staff, a peace officer or a detective from our NYPD squad will be assigned to conduct the operation or to assist in it. Absent specific safety concerns or operational needs that require special training, field work is carried out by the investigator, auditor, or attorney who is otherwise responsible for the investigation, regardless of their peace officer or non-peace officer status. This kind of law enforcement management moves cases along and I believe makes the best use of our resources. <clears throat> These sorts of reforms speak to the larger philosophy that I am working to promote at DOI which is to ensure that our decisions, whether about investigative steps or allocation of resources or external relationships, are governed primarily by the question, what is best for the case or investigation? What will produce the most effective resolution and successful results? My goal as DOI Commissioner is to ensure that we are a top-notch investigative agency, performing at the highest levels of professionalism, effectiveness, and ethics on every case, whether big or small. DOI's relationships within the city with fellow law enforcement partners, with prosecutors, and with the city agencies we oversee are integral to the work we do and to achieving these goals. DOI must be known for setting and meeting high standards for itself that include finding and acting on the facts without fear or favor or political agenda, and demonstrating that integrity is at the heart of everything we do. These are not just platitudes for other agencies, but the benchmarks for DOI as well. Turning to IT upgrades on our forfeiture funding, critical upgrades to DOI's information technology infrastructure are needed this year. DOI's co current computer and other IT equipment are past their five-year life cycle. And as a result, DOI requested and the city has already approved $14.8 million for capital costs that include the purchase of network servers, computers, and other hardware. DOI has requested an additional $6 million for computer software and subscriptions over the next five years, and we currently expect that DOI's forfeiture funds will be available to support the majority of that cost. Since we are using forfeiture funds to support some costs associated with our IT upgrade, I'd like to explain how these funds play a role in supporting specific law enforcement operations at DOI, how we acquire such funds, and the specific rules that limit their use. Both federal and state law allow the profits of criminal activity to be forfeited to the government and shared with investigating agencies that worked on the case, with the general guideline that these funds must support law enforcement activities. The majority of DOI's forfeiture funds are the result of partnering with federal prosecutors, so I will focus briefly on federal funds. There are very specific federal rules as to what forfeiture funds may and may not be used for. 
as a beneficiary of some of these federally regulated funds. DOI has used them within the relevant guidelines to, for example, support law enforcement training for DOI and other city agencies, and to update our, ag our agency's computer infrastructure. These forfeiture funds, however, are finite. And as noted, they may only be used for certain law enforcement related purposes as set out in federal guidelines. Thus, for example, forfeiture funds may not be used to fund salaries for permanent staff positions or otherwise substitute for items that the city must fund. The majority, majority of our current federal forfeiture funds are the result of an investigation DOI conducted that led to multiple arrests and convictions associated with the corruption scandal linked to the implementation of the city's automated timekeeping system, otherwise known as city time. These funds are allocated by year and are expected to be fully spent by 2022. Although our cases continue to generate additional forfeiture funds each year, there is no case currently charged that is expected to produce a forfeiture amount anywhere close to that generated by the city time case. Restoring and expanding on our relationships with the two federal prosecutors in the city, as well as the five district attorneys and the special narcotics prosecutor, is an important part of not only producing successful outcomes by ensuring access to the most suitable prosecutor for a given case, but also improving our ability to claw back criminal theft of city money through forfeiture and putting that money back into law enforcement operations. Turning to our request for additional lines and funding for a background investigation unit. As I noted earlier, DOI is asking for 13 additional positions for our background investigation unit, which provides a vital service to all city agencies and has been struggling for years under an unacceptable backlog. Our original new needs request to the Office of Management and Budget last fall requested funding for all 13 new positions. If we secure approval for the 13 additional lines, I am pleased to report that I believe that DOI can fund three of the 13 needed positions out of its current budget. Because of the high priority that I have placed on addressing the background unit backlog and doing so without negatively affecting investigative work, we have identified this funding through savings and overtime and restructuring of the executive staff. Accordingly, I am only requesting funding for 10 of the 13 new positions at an estimated cost of $690,000. Currently, the unit is overseen by a director and consists of four other supervisors, 13 investigators, and two administrative staff. DOI has identified three people to fill open lines for the background unit for investigative positions. However, due to the city's partial freeze on hiring, we are currently unable to onboard these individuals and the positions remain vacant. DOI is mandated to conduct background investigations on all managerial positions in the city, all individuals earning more than $100,000 a year, individuals directly involved in city contracts and zoning decisions, and individuals who work on the city's computer programs and other sensitive positions. While DOI's background unit has always had some backlog, it has increased over the past several years due to a larger number of incoming requests for background investigations. Without additional staff, the majority of these requests became part of the backlog, and in some cases are still a part of it. For instance, approximately 1,900 routine background investigations are still open from 2016, a year that DOI received 3,731 background investigation requests. Let me provide a glimpse into the volume of the problem on a monthly basis. In fiscal 2018, DOI's background unit received an average of approximately 236 new investigations each month, while closing an average of approximately 193 investigations per month. Even with that kind of close rate, the backlog was still increasing by approximately 42 investigations each month. As a result of these factors, the backlog has risen to approximately 6,300 background investigations, not being actively worked and awaiting completion. Bluntly, DOI's mandated mission to screen all sensitive and high-level city employees is not being met, nor can it be met with the current staffing. It also means that the majority of those job candidates have already begun employment with the City of New York and are awaiting the results of their background investigation, sometimes for years, a vulnerability that causes me great concern. I have spent many hours personally reviewing this problem, spending real time in the background unit to see and understand the flow of work and how it is being managed. DOI has taken many important steps to address the backlog, even without additional lines. First, the unit was restructured in late 2018, shortly before my arrival at DOI, to
to attack the backlog on two fronts. As new background investigation requests come into DOI, a dedicated intake team in background is performing an initial review of them to assess if there are any that should be expedited due to red flags that based on our experience are most likely to result in an adverse employment decision. If red flags are identified, those applications are routed to a dedicated expedite team to be finalized. The remaining background applications deemed routine are routed to one of two background teams that process routine applications in the order they were received. Second, under my tenure, DOI has moved to redirect some resources to the background unit on a temporary basis. Wherever possible, newly hired investigators now begin their tenure at DOI with a three-month rotation in the background unit, which both provides additional hands in background and gives new DOI investigators valuable investigative training prior to being assigned casework. In addition, existing DOI administrative staff in other parts of the agency are being assigned tasks to help advance the unit's efforts to complete and close background investigations. We are continuing to regularly assess the process and the allocation of staffing to ensure that we are operating at maximum efficiency. But these improvements and adjustments are nowhere near enough to address the problem, and I respectfully ask the Council to grant our request of 13 additional personnel lines with funding for 10 of those lines. The 13 positions would include 10 new investigators, two supervisors, and one administrative assistant. We would anticipate organizing this new staff into two new teams assigned to process the routine applications by date of receipt in order to be fully dedicated to clearing the backlog. I realize that the ask of 13 additional personnel has been made for the past several years and that even with DOI providing funding for th three of the positions, it is a considerable financial ask requiring an estimated $690,000. But I see no other way for DOI to carry out its mandate of conducting and completing essential background investigations, clear the backlog in less than five years, and eventually move the unit to where I believe it needs to be, which is a goal of completing all background investigations in an average of 120 days or fewer. In closing, I want the Council and the public to know how much of an honor it is for me to serve as DOI Commissioner. I am so grateful for the opportunity to tackle all the challenges that come with this role. There is no other municipal oversight agency quite like DOI, one supported by strong legal statutes that help us expose fraud, waste, abuse, and inefficiency, and an agency that helps instill confidence in the public workforce and in city government. At DOI, you have a team of nearly 600 city employees, administrative staff, investigators, auditors, lawyers, inspectors general, all dedicated to watching out for the city and for all New Yorkers and preventing corruption from taking root. I'm extremely proud of our staff and the work that we do. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions the council has for me. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. I have a few questions and then I'll give my colleagues an opportunity to ask questions as well. Uh, you, you testify that DOI has found $350,000 in savings for FY 2019. I'm sorry, this is FY 2020, actually. Yeah. FY 2020 by reducing overtime costs. How will you achieve this reduction when historically overtime expenditures have exceeded the budgeted amount? So, for example, in FY 2018, DOI had an overtime budget of 110000 but the actual expenditure was well over a million, 10 times higher than your budgeted amount. It's almost as if the budgeted amount is meaningless. Uh, so that's one question. And the second question I would have is since FY4, in FY14, your overtime expenditure was 395,000 and it rose to well over a million in FY18, uh, what accounts for the exponential growth in overtime expenditures in the span of a few years? So um, we, we have primarily identified the overtime savings that I referred to and that you referenced at the beginning of your question, um, primarily through some of the changes that I referenced in my testimony to the Peace Officer Program. So I think that some of the increase in overtime was related to this policy of allowing only peace officers to do field work. What that meant was that it increased the strain on the peace officer portion of our staff while sometimes creating situations where the non-peace officer investigators and auditors weren't able to move their cases along as quickly as they otherwise could. And so some of the overtime demand comes from 
only peace officers can go in the field. I've changed that policy. Some come, came from the investment in academy by shortening the academy from four months to three. We've realized some overtime savings there. Um, in the past few years, DOI had instituted a command center that had to be staffed at night and on the weekends. We have changed the role of the command center so that it is used only when um, we believe it's necessary for law enforcement purposes during an active operation, um, such as arrests, search warrants, things of that nature. Um, and then, of course, various other changes that we've made, primarily focused on the Peace Officer Program, is where I think we've realized most of those overtime savings that I refer to. Um, turning to the second part of your question about the relative increases, so I don't know for sure because I haven't studied in detail from fiscal 2014 to now. I can say there's some of the overtime increase is probably related to headcount increases. Um, so proportionally, so there's a proportional increase and an um, absolute increase. Um, so I, I would imagine that some of the increase from fiscal 2014 to now um, comes pr from a proportional increase based on increased headcount. But I also think that much of that, my sense is that much of that increase is probably related to some of these changes to the Peace Officer Program that I referenced earlier. So your analysis is that the Peace Officer Program is what largely accounts for the growth in overtime expenditures, is that? Yes, I think that accounted for for sure for a significant and, and portion. What was the original rationale for the policy of limiting um, field work to peace officers? So I can only sort of speak second or third hand because of course I wasn't at DOI when the policy was created, but my understanding is that it was driven by a combination of um, what people at the time perceived to be safety concerns as well as a desire to increase the importance and centrality of peace officers to DOI's work. And what were the, what were the safety concerns? Well, there are, the safety, con DOI's work spans a tremendous, um, there's a tremendous breadth to DOI's work. So yeah. much of it is things that really do not present safety issues, such as going to another city agency during the business day to meet with witnesses or get documents, in my view, those present no safety concerns that require specialized law enforcement training. But we also are engaged in operations such as arrests, search warrants, what I would call, refer to as sort of an uncontrolled knock, where you're just going to knock on someone's door and ask them if they'll speak to you and you don't really know for sure who's on the other side of that door, as well as participation in actions at Rikers Island on the NYCHA gang task force and number of other law enforcement task forces. So there are situations that present safety risks in DUI's work, and then there are many situations that, in, in our view, do not present any unusual safety risk. So I think, if I understand correctly, again, second or third hand, that the prior policy was based on a view that it would be better practice to err on the side of assuming a safety risk any time DOI investigators leave the building. Um, having reassessed that, I don't believe that that's the best practice, so we've changed it. So are you taking a case-by-case -case approach? Um, obviously, if, if a DOI investigator is meeting with an agency official at City Hall, that's not a dangerous situation that requires an armed peace officer. That's right. But, but what if you're not uh, conducting a gang operation in a public housing development? Is that the kind of situation that would warrant, a, like are you yeah. making determinations based on a on a case-by-case -case basis. That's right. So we have we have given some um, broad parameters of guidance to the inspectors general who run each squad um, about what the kinds of situations that, in our view, present a heightened risk and not, typically. Um, many, of, many of those decisions are run up the chain through our chief of investigations, who has 38 years of law enforcement experience, um, to make a final call as to whether it's a situation that we're all comfortable um, with any DOI employee conducting, or whether it's one that, at a minimum, would need a peace officer or NYPD detective from our squad to accompany, or perhaps be a situation where we would only feel comfortable with the participants all being people with additional law enforcement training. And, and in your testimony, you were critical of the peace officer program. You said, quote, but certain aspects of the program had expanded beyond what I believe is appropriate or necessary 
to support DOI's investigative work. Can you clarify that? Um, yeah, so look, I think that um, different managers can make different decisions and it doesn't mean that one is correct and one is not correct. All I can do is exercise my own best judgment in consultation with people whose judgment I trust to do what I think is best for DOI. And in evaluating the Peace Officer Program, I, I can give you one example. Um, it previously had been standard for all peace officers in initial training to be sent upstate to a, um, a high-speed vehicle, tactical vehicle training course that was four days off-site. Um, in my view, the, our jurisdiction is limited to the five boroughs other than the watershed. Um, I did not believe it was necessary, a necessary expenditure for our peace officers to have specialized on-site training in conducting high-speed vehicle chases and other advanced tactical vehicle maneuvers. So we have eliminated that. That's just one example. Um, we have eliminated that as a standard part of our training for peace officers. Just how many peace officers do you have? Um, I it post approximately 200 at this point. Approximately 200 of DOI staff are peace officers. Right. As you know, there's a, a real crisis when it comes to the background investigations. You know, as you acknowledged, in fiscal year 2015, the department took an average of 188 days to complete a background investigation and 61% of the total investigations were closed within six months. Uh, three years later, DOI spent an average of 533 days to complete a background investigation, with only 39% of cases closed within six months. Uh, what impact will your new budget request, if it were to go forward, have on, on the slow response time when it comes to these background investigations? So I, I should clarify first that there, um, the story behind these numbers is a little more complex than it appears on its face. Um, prior to 2016, the numbers of number of days to complete a background investigation and number that were closed within six months were based on a date chosen for the time the background investigation was opened, meaning the time, the day someone started working on it to the time that it was closed and results sent to the agency. Um, there were many instances, I really don't know how many, but many under that way of counting in which investigations had been received by DOI considerably before the date they were deemed opened. So in 2016, again, before my arrival at DOI, a decision was made to change the way that we calculated these numbers, to make them more transparent so we could really understand the scope, the true scope of the problem. So beginning um, in 2016, so that would be reflected in the t fiscal 2017 numbers and forward, the number is calculated based on the date the request for investigation is received at DOI to the date that is closed. So um, I, I actually asked my background um, unit supervisor, the person who runs the whole unit, to run for me, if she could, how our numbers would look in fiscal 2018 if we were applying the same methodology that had been used prior to 2016. And um, that number would be approximately 260 days from open to close and about 50% closed in six months. So on a comparison of fiscal 17 forward to prior years, um, the bare numbers are a little bit misleading, but to well, the, me the, what the, that- The comparison is misleading. The comparison but, is misleading. But, but the original methodology, the counting methodology, disguised the true lag in DOI's background investigation. In my view, yes. I think that it, it um, I, I don't think it was, inten I'm not saying it was intentionally done to do that, but the true picture is more accurately reflected by the fiscal yeah. 17 numbers forward. Um, I'm going to ask you specific. I'm going to ask you about a specific case. I understand that there are constraints of confidentiality. I'll ask the question. If you can do your best to answer those questions within the constra constraints of confidentiality, as you know, uh, the the DOI background check of of Kevin O'Brien, formerly the chief of staff for the De Blasio administration, failed to uncover his pattern of sexual harassment at his previous place of employment, the Democratic Governors Association. What actions are you taking to assess 
what, if anything, went wrong with the background investigation into Mr. O'Brien? So uh, when that situation came to light, um, I we certainly looked back at our own records to make sure that we were comfortable that DOI had not missed anything in its process. And in the course of reviewing the file myself, speaking to the investigators who conducted that background investigation and reviewing the documents, I am confident that DOI did not um, miss anything or did not in any way sort of let down the team with regards to the background investigation of Mr. O'Brien. Inquiries were made of the Democratic Governors Association um, and based on information provided by Mr. O'Brien and his prior employer, um, we were informed that there was no adverse information related to his prior employment and we reported that to City Hall. I guess do we accept a situation like Mr. O'Brien's as an inevitability or I mean how do we prevent a repeat in the future? Um, and I know it's a hard question, but. Well, uh, this may sound cynical. I guess I, I'm a cynical prosecutor. Um, sometimes people lie about things that are important to them. And I think that if people are, people at whatever place, yeah. whether an applicant or prior employment, employer, current employer, um, have a reason for not telling the truth that overrides the consequences of not telling the truth, um, there's little to be done for that other than to try to create deterrent factors that change that balance between people's reasons for not telling the truth and the consequences for not telling the truth. Now, if I lie to an FBI investigator, it's a crime, a felony, right? Are there legal consequences for lying to a DOI background investigator? Yes. So our background investigation form um, is required to be notarized and part of the notarized certification the applicant is informed that any false statements on that form could subject them to criminal prosecution. Um, potentially a felony would require some aggravators, but either a misdemeanor or a felony charge for um, false statements. And so Mr. O'Brien signed a notarized document under the, the threat of perjury or yes. the charge of, did he lie to DOI? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to answer that in this forum. Or is DOI investigating whether he lied or? I can't comment on that. Okay. Um, my only concern is if if there's no resolution to the matter, I worry about sending the message that you could lie to DOI with impunity. That even if it's a crime on paper, if we're not willing to investigate and enforce, what message does that send to the rest of the world about so I, I, the seriousness I, of truth telling to DOI? I, I certainly tell you I share that concern and yeah. um, I think that it's an extremely serious matter that should be pursued with all available options. Um, I'm just not gonna comment on a particular case, but I share your concern. Okay. I might ask a more specific, but tell me if you can comment. Did the Democratic Governors Association lie to you or mislead DOI? I'm not going to. I'm not going to comment on that in this okay. forum. Are, are you aware of any? There, there was a New York Times article about neutral references. Uh, are you aware of any neutral reference agreement between the Democratic Governors Association and Mr. O'Brien? Um, I, I did read that article, but I'm I'm not in a position to comment further in okay. this forum. I'll have more questions later, but I want to hand it off to Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, nice to meet you. Thank I'd you. love to have a formal uh, sit down at some point and get to know each other a little bit better. Of course. Great. Um, just to follow up on uh, the Chair's question about um, sexual harassment, identifying that they're not identifying that there had been a history of sexual harassment, are you considering changing? the set of questions that you, that DOI would ask a former employer to include the question, is there a history of sexual harassment? Or is there a history of confirmed sexual harassment? So I, I think that I would put that question sort of into two parts. One is um, the questions that we ask applicants. And we did take a look at that. Uh, in my view, the question that we ask applicants about sort of any prior um, adverse situations at pre previous employment is currently so broad that it adequately captures any um, investigation, resignation in lieu of termination, um, mutual agreement to leave employment because of an investigation into misconduct, such that in my view, as to the form, an applicant who answers no to our existing questions 
is not going to be induced to answer yes by a more specific question that specifically references sexual harassment. Um, so I don't believe there's any change needed in our paper forms. Um, turning to the questions we ask employers, I think historically we have found um, that our questions, which tend to be quite broad to employers, are best suited to kind of gathering in anything adverse rather than specific categories. But in the wake of the situation and general discussion um, about how these matters are handled by employers, um, we are talking about whether a change might be needed. We haven't reached any decision about that. So I would posit that um, <clears throat> a broad question yields um, a broad answer, and that by specifying specific areas of importance that you um, will capture more information. So while I understand from a legal perspective, having a broader category technically includes all of these um, subcategories and certainly agree with you, I think we're at a point in time in history when racial, um, homophobic, um, and certainly sexual harassment, all those issues, um, our cult we, are our, we are changing our culture. And um, there are people who would like to forget that they were, um, um, that it was determined that any one of those things did happen and that they, because they would like to forget it, they do. And um, there's a difference between what should happen and what really happens. And given the reality of people describing their own behavior and not being able to understand that that is sexual harassment or is misogynistic, homophobic, or racist behavior, um, we have so far to go on that, I would really urge you to think a lot harder about that and in fact include those specific examples um, much more clearly and specifically. Does that make sense or? No, it definitely does make sense and I would say we're always um, open to reassessing our processes. We, this is a service we provide to the city and so um, it's not a I think the hiring agencies, uh, I want to be clear, have the primary responsibility for employer reference checks, um, but we do understand the important role that DOIs, you know, I think my testimony, what I've said so far about how troubled I am by the backlog, I hope makes clear how much we understand the important role of DOIs background checks. So we're certainly open to rethinking that and I'll take that under consideration. Yeah, I'm not going to litigate this here. I would punt it back to the chair, but to me that's a very disheartening response because agencies will, I just came out of a contracts hearing where, you know, the who is responsible for what is super amorphous. So the notion that DOI provides a service to an agency is confusing to me. Um, I think I would word it that DOI has a job to do and included in that job is reviewing whatever it is you review. And if you're explicitly not reviewing a history of sexual harassment or misogynistic or whatever behavior and thinking in your mind that, oh, the agency should really be doing that, I would urge us to have an open dialogue about who exactly is responsible for doing that background check. Um, uh, we don't have to discuss it now, but that is very disheartening I, to me. I just want to make clear, I, this is probably a failure of communication on my part. I, I don't think we are at all talking about different things or different approaches to this problem. My, um, my only point is that there is a shared responsibility. That's in no way to say that DOI is not taking incredibly seriously its role to investigate any prior adverse 
um, employment action. So I right. really, I, I don't think we disagree. And, and again, I'm happy to have a fuller conversation about this. Yeah, Chair, this wasn't even my set of questions, but I'm very disturbed by that answer. And if we could follow up on that, I'd appreciate that. You know, the, the question of taking responsibility for whether or not there's a history of sexual harassment should not be ambiguous. And my guess is, is that an agency is looking at skill set and counting on DOI to identify the broader set of issues that don't have to do with skill set, but have to do with historic behavior at work. And we are doing that. Okay. Actually, my question to you is about a uh, specific area, and it's not going to take a lot of time, and I know we have to move rooms. So very quickly, um, uh, the, um, it is my understanding that, the office, that, that your office has challenges working sometimes with agencies, and they're being cooperative with your, uh, with your department. Um, specifically, I'm wondering about the NYPD Special Victims Division and the challenges that happened previously. Are you encouraging, are you encouraging challenges again? And do you expect to have another report coming out soon about the adult squad or about the child squad? And are you getting cooperation from the NYPD? So I, I can't comment on uh, what specific things we're investigating or what reports are going to be coming. Um, I think in response to your core question, it is true that the relationship with NYPD in terms of access has been a challenging one in the past. Um, I have taken on that challenge. We've had some meetings already with senior folks at the PD. There's a new Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters. We'll be meeting with him in the upcoming weeks in an effort to try to resolve these. I, I, it has been a problem. We are working to resolve it, and I have some level of optimism that we'll, that we'll get there. So the consequences of that problem are that we are not exposing the fact that there are sexual assault cases that are not being investigated, that are being swept under the rug, and in particular, the drug-induced sexual assault cases are being swept under the rug today, and there are serious consequences of that for our, the people who live in New York City. And I would urge us to figure out a way to get past that stonewalling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Commissioner, as exhilarating as your testimony has been, <laughs> the cameras are not here for you. So, we are actually going to relocate to the committee room so that.